All right, and you can switch your um, you can switch your cameras off. I'll just let you know when we're when we're live. And okay, perfect. Thank you. Hey Desmond, how's it going? Hi, hi, Led. So just to let you two know, I'm gonna start in a second. Um, you can you can actually just switch your screens off and stay muted mm -hmm. live. I will let people know to switch their cameras on and we'll get get started. Hello. Hi, Benka. Hi, welcome. Hello. Can't hear you now. Hi, everybody. Hello to everybody at home. Welcome, welcome, panelists. We're now live on Facebook and Zoom, and you can switch your cameras on. It's amazing to see people joining us in such great numbers. Hello. Hi, Rima. Welcome. Welcome, Khaled. Welcome, welcome. Um, we're putting the Facebook Live uh, share in. People can share that with folks at home, just in case the room fills up. Our capacity is 500. Um, Welcome, welcome. Just letting folks kind of come in a little bit before we start our event. Panelists, uh, you can switch on your cameras. We are now live on both Facebook and Zoom. Welcome, welcome, welcome to everyone. This is our virtual rally, Defend Sarajama, Stop the Attack on Gaza. And today we are joined by a host of stellar, stellar speakers in support of Sarajama and against Israel's, Israel's violence in Gaza. In Palestine, um, I'm Bianca Mageni. I'm the director of the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute. Uh, we're one of the co-organizers of this discussion alongside Just Peace Advocates. Um, I'm speaking to you from Montreal, um, which is in the territory of the Ganyangahaga people, Dojage. I also want to um, acknowledge uh, our co-organizing organization. Again, Just Peace Advocates, their executive director, Karen Rodman, is behind the scenes. She's going to be helping us. She can be putting relevant information, actions you can take, important updates, educational resources. Um, the chat's going to be open. During the event, I can already see lots of people saying hi, hello from Ottawa, free Palestine, yes. Um, please keep all your messages uh, free from any racist or otherwise harmful commentary, of course, uh, but we do want to hear from you. Um, let us know what territory you're tuning in from, share your words of solidarity, your virtual chants. Um, Treaty One, yes, hello from Montreal. Um, yes, yes, hello, hello Zara from Waterloo. It's great to see you all. Um, yes, Free Palestine. Solidarity with Sarah Jama, yes. So we're live on Zoom as well as Facebook, and the link is um, facebook.com slash Canada Policy. If you'd like to share this broadcast, um, there were nearly a thousand people that uh, registered for this uh, rally in less than 36 hours. Um, so we may exceed our room limit. Um, usually about half of those who register um, attend in person with others watching the replay. There will be a replay. Um, please do share uh, to Facebook Live though. 
um, Karen is putting that link in. Um, so for our event today, over the past 20 days, uh, Israel has killed over 7,000 Palestinians in Gaza, um, and it's injured 20,000 more. Um, the 8,000 plus missiles that Israel has launched um, into an area the size of Montreal has destroyed uh, 20,000 buildings. The quantity of explosives um, that have been dropped on Gaza exceeds 12,000 tons. This is equivalent to the size of an atomic bomb. The atomic bomb that the US dropped on Hiroshima, it's unfathomable. Um, and we can't unsee the horror, the agony, the devastation that continues to flash across our screens in real time. Um, and yet there are those that would rather um, that we stay silent, um, that we stay complicit. Um, and for standing out um, and standing up against these horrors, um, Sarah Jama was censured by Ontario's legislature and kicked out of the NDP caucus. This is a shame. Um, the anti-Palestinian racism that we've seen is flagrant, um, but this is also a story of anti-Blackness. And today's emergency rally has brought together an array of voices to defend Sarah Jama and to oppose the attack on Gaza. We want a ceasefire. We want the legislature to remove its censure um, and we're calling on Merit Stiles to reverse her decision. So justice for Sarah Jama, justice for the children of Gaza, uh, justice for Palestine. Um, today's rally, um, we have quite a few people to hear from and time is limited. So without further ado, um, I'm gonna say, let's get to it. Um, our first speaker is author and activist Desmond Cole. Um, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, Desmond, welcome. Gonna make me go first and break the ice, huh? Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you to the organizers. Thank you, Bianca. Thank you to um, all the organizers of this event for everybody who's here in attendance. Um, let me start by addressing Sarah Jama directly. Sarah, I love you. You are my sister. I am so proud of you. You continue to teach me and to inform my political struggle. You are so much more than what is being said about you, being written about you. And I continue to be by your side because of the values that you expressed, the incredible work that you do, and because of the community of your loved ones, family, and friends that I am very proud to be a part of. In the face of the tremendous pressure that you're under, Sarah, it's your health and it's your well being that I care about the most. And so I'm sending you and your husband, Amr, all my love and support and reminding you that your survival and rest and recovery in all of this is paramount. It's one thing for people to say that they support Sarah, but I need people to qualify what this support means. Many people have only found a voice for Sarah Jama in recent days, despite knowing her for years and being alongside her for years. And to these people, I would like to ask, when did you support Sarah? Did you support her when uh, pro-apartheid lobby groups were trying to derail her campaign for office earlier this year before we got to any of what's happening now? Or is it only since uh, she was expelled from the party that you decided that you would say something? Did you support her when she was being arrested in encampments, speaking up to the mayor of Hamilton? What does support mean in this context? I would also like to say that in this moment, the most transformative support for Jama is support for Palestinian liberation and land back. If you say that you support Sarah Jama, but you are silent on Israel's occupation and apartheid treatment of Palestinians, what is the value of that support? Marit Stiles, the leader of the Ontario NDP and the person responsible for removing Jama from the party's caucus, has uh, become indignant. I've seen in recent days that people are questioning uh, her party's positions. In response to a recent social media critique that the uh, ONDP should support a ceasefire, Stiles replied that, quote, I have called for it, meaning the ceasefire, literally every day. Now we know that Sarah Jama called for a ceasefire before her party did, but why is that the limited test? Does Stiles and her party believe that what is happening inside of Israel and occupied Palestine is apartheid? 
Does the ONDP support the end of Israel's blockade on Gaza? Does the ONDP support Canada's continued military aid to Israel? What is the ONDP's position on the settlements in the West Bank or on checkpoints or on the right of displaced Palestinians to return to their lands? We're not fighting over one word or phrase or the timing of a specific utterance here. We're asking this political party to weigh in on the full scope of Israel's domination of Palestinian people, and they have failed up to this point. Let me briefly address those who are calling on the Ontario NDP to reinstate Jama. The notion that Jama might return to a party that has treated her this way and is continuing to treat her this way, uh, it makes me sick. It depoliticizes everything that the Ontario NDP has done to Jama and frames it as a mistake or a misunderstanding, which it is not. Since Stiles expelled Jama, she and her party have tried to paint our sister as an uncontrollable and unreasonable person. And this is being done on purpose, everyone. And it exploits all the tropes related to Sarah's blackness, her womanhood, her Muslimness, and her disability. Why are people asking for a party who is still treating Jama like this to take her back? Why? I don't understand. Let her go and let her say and do the principled things that she was not able to do as a member of the ONDP. Whatever prestige you want restored to Jama by her former party, remember that this would come at the cost of her own integrity and the sacrifices that she's made. The political differences between Jama and the Ontario NDP are real and we should accept them and distinguish them instead of asking for a depoliticized reconciliation that undermines Jama's principled uh, stand. And for those who mourn the so-called infighting you have been witnessing, all I can say is that the fight to bring the NDP in line with the Palestinian liberation struggle is worth having and worth fighting for. Everything that has been exposed about that party in these last days and weeks is important. And um, a united party, that can silence or marginalize the Palestinian struggle is a weak and ineffectual party. I've been done with the NDP. I'm not disappointed in them. Any of us who have been paying attention for years should have seen this coming. Let me turn my attention to Gaza specifically and to the prime minister of this country, Justin Trudeau and to the liberal uh, administration that he leads. This country and our Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and his Liberal government are supporting a state in Israel that has now, as of earlier this week, attacked one third of the hospitals in Gaza and two thirds of the primary health care clinics, which have been shut down uh, due to uh, damage from hostilities or from lack of fuel. Uh, so let me be clear about that. That, that statistic is about uh, damage to uh, uh, facilities and lack of fuel. But in terms of actual attacks, uh, according to the WHO and the United Nations, there have been 72 documented attacks on healthcare facilities in Gaza. A lot of people are arguing about the attack on one hospital in Gaza. There have been 72 attacks on healthcare facilities. And Justin Trudeau and the Liberal government, you are supporting and backstopping that with your negligence. You are supporting the attacks as of October 24th on 207 educational facilities within Gaza that have been hit by Israel, including at least 29 UNRWA schools. Justin Trudeau, you are siding with an Israeli defense minister, Yoav Gallant, who in announcing his siege on Gaza said, we are fighting human animals and we are acting accordingly. And I wanna remind people who would say that Gallant was referring to Hamas, and not Palestinians generally when he uttered this human animals remark, is that he said that after telling us that Israel would cut food, fuel, electricity, and water to all Gazans, not to Hamas. This is who Justin Trudeau is standing with. He is standing with Benjamin Netanyahu, a man who is engaged in Holocaust revisionism by saying that in late 1941, and I will quote Benjamin Netanyahu, quote, Hitler didn't want to exterminate the Jews at the time. He wanted to expel the Jews, end of quote. Netanyahu then blamed a Palestinian Grand Mufti for giving Hitler the idea of exterminating rather than expelling uh, Jewish people from Germany and Europe. 
Netanyahu's statement was so shocking that it prompted a rare contradictory response from the German government, whose spokesperson replied, quote, we know that responsibility for this crime against humanity is German and very much our own, unquote. Justin Trudeau's government is siding with an Israeli regime by giving it military aid and increasing by 33% in 2021 amid Israel's bombing of Gaza, increasing by 33% that year the amount of military aid that Canada gives uh, to Israel. Canada is supporting a country right now whose military is going into the West Bank, taking people's phones to see what social media accounts that they support and arresting them if the answer is not what they want to see and hear. Justin Trudeau, this is what you're siding with. This is what your government is siding with. A government that determines how people will live and how they will treat people based on their perceived race, ethnicity, and religion. The world is rallying for an end to this discriminatory and deadly occupation, and the liberal government is on the wrong side and needs to get on the right side of history. We need to keep pushing every day for this liberal government for the things that we hear uh, coming out of Gaza, a ceasefire, immediately a ceasefire, an end to the siege, the return of food, fuel, water, electricity, immediately to Gaza, um, the end to these calls for people to evacuate the parts of Gaza that they live in and to go somewhere else when there is nowhere safe in that land for them to go, the end of military aid to Israel, and the challenging of the blockade. These are the demands, the primary demands that I see, be, see being repeated by Palestinian people. I want to repeat them once again here and to say, let us not be uh, distracted by, you know, whatever the fate now of these political entities is that have gone after Sarah. Doug Ford's going to get his due. Don't worry, everybody. But we came here and we started all of this to raise our voices for Gaza. That's what we're going to continue to do. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Desmond. Um, thanks for being here and for the tremendous support and solidarity that you have shown Sarah. Um, and also about this reminder of, of timing being of the essence. When do we support people? When do we speak out? Timing matters. We're all in a period of deep grief. Thank you for speaking to that aspect of what we're going through collectively. Few comments from the chat. Danielle says, amen. Desmond, Robert says, peace and justice. Siona thanks Sarah for her bravery and courage. Camille says, we love you, Sarah. Marty, free Palestine. Jason says, justice for Sarah Jama, freedom for Palestine. Now is the time to be courageously truthful, says Vince. Um, so next up, uh, we're gonna be hearing from author and activist, um, feminist, the incredible Judy Rebick. Thank you, Bianca. Thanks, Desmond. Um, when I saw that, uh, the NDP had expelled, the ONDP had expelled uh, Sarah from the caucus. I was, I was horrified, okay, like horrified. I, uh, I've been fighting with the NDP for like 40 years, maybe 50 actually, when I think about it, from 73, 1973 uh, was when I first started. And one of the, and I, I think this is really the worst thing they've ever done. Um, I, I maybe somebody can find something worse, but I don't know. And stu also the stupidest thing they ever did as a political party. Um, and, you know, my solidarity is completely with Sarah here, with Sarah Jama. I don't know her. I've never met her, but I've always, but I've been very inspired by her work uh, since I, I, I knew about it with Black Lives Matter um, and, the, and the demonstrations then. But I want to maybe put a little bit of a historical perspective here, because it's not the first time that the NDP has behaved in this in, in this kind of way. Although it's, I think it's unusual for them to expel someone from the caucus so publicly. Sven Robinson, for example, is someone who um, was often at odds with the party leadership and spoke out against the party line on things and even voted against the party in parliament. And he, was and he was never thrown out of caucus. He was removed as critic, but never thrown out of caucus. 
So, uh, so I think that needs to be looked at. But what, what I observe is that every time there's a rise in social movements, and now we see a massive anti-war movement emerging in this battle to defend uh, Palestine, it's massive. I, I mean, we haven't seen anything like this in, dec in a decade anyway, more, all over the world. Um, when, when, whenever social movements rise, the NDP, there's a conflict with the NDP. So the waffle was first example of that, which was the anti-Vietnam War movement and the rise of the youth movement. And the NDP made the biggest mistake ever made by driving out the waffle. They lost the whole generation of, um, of uh, activists and they, and, and, they, and they risk doing the same now. And, um, and then I was involved in the New Politics Initiative, which was also an attempt to push the NDP to, to be closer to social movement and accept social movements. And there it was, you know, we can't, I don't have time to get into it, but anyway, so that was the other thing. So this, is, this conflict is between a political party and, a so, and social movements. And in this case, focused on an individual who is brave, who has who was moved by her values to defend the Palestinian people, to defend Gaza, and you know, broke the rules of the caucus. So what? You know, it was urgent, right? But the bureaucrats in the party see that as just the end of the world. And so we have a clash in values, we have a clash in politics. But the our focus has to be we have to defend Sarah. And it's important to be clear if she doesn't want to go back. Right. Then we have to ask for an apology, not for her to be. I don't know what her position is. And maybe someone could say that. Does she want to be back in the caucus or not? And I think that's important for us to know in this campaign of defending her. If not, then she should get an apology for what happened if she decides she doesn't want to go back. Um, but we also have to keep organizing uh, against the war. And this is where I have a concern because the federal party is the only party. The federal NDP is the only party that is arguing for ceasefire. So, so the people who want to just clo close the door to the NDP, I think in this fight, everything's at stake here. The, not only the, the lives of the people in Gaza, obviously, is the immediate, uh, the immediate state, but the Palestinian people as a whole are under attack. And the right of Palestine to self-determination is under attack. But more than that, if Israel continues this siege, if they attack, if they go in with ground troops, the whole Middle East will explode. And that means war uh, on a global scale. So there's huge stakes here. And I think we have to make alliances. I've been involved in, in a coalition, in building a coalition that, that, um, that released uh, a statement for a ceasefire and to stop the blockade. And people wanted it to be stronger, the statement. But some people won't agree with that. You know, the propaganda from Israel has been, has had has a big effect. You know, they weaponize the Holocaust. They weaponize the, the, the anti-Semitism. Um, so that if you're critical of Israel, you're anti-Semitic. It's quite extraordinary. Even I've been called like that. I hate Jews. I'm not Jewish, you know? Um, so... Like, so the, the, the stakes are very high and we have to build alliances. And unfortunately, and the NDP is part of that because they are calling for a ceasefire, at least federally. And so I think we have to both defend Jama, either insist she be reintegrated if she wants to be, or that there be an apology if she doesn't want to be. And secondly, that, um, that we, uh, we ally with the federal NDP who are the only, one, the only political party calling for a ceasefire. So maybe people don't like that position, but I think, I, I think that's uh, what we need to do. And uh, it's not, you know, I, I've worked a lot in my life with people that I didn't like and I didn't agree with and I fought with all the rest of the time, but we could agree, let's say on pro-choice or we could agree on something else. And here, I think we have to build the broadest coalition possible for a ceasefire and an end of the siege, and then build a, and then continue to build what I think is emergent now, a, a mass, a massive peace movement that can stop this kind of uh, aggression against uh, and colonialism 
um, uh, and stop war. And that's what we have to do, or you know, it'll be the end of us. So anyway, all of us. So anyway, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Thanks for your words today and for reminding us of the stakes um, as well, which are so, so high. Um, and thanks for your decades of feminist activism, social justice activism. Um, we have lots and lots of comments from the chat. We are totally at capacity um, and, and, and filled up pretty much right off the hop. So for folks who can do it, please do share the broadcast uh, on your Facebook so that other people can, um, can be here with us uh, live. Um, Memuna in the chat says, justice for our black disabled Muslim sister, Sarah. Uh, Naeem says, shame on you, Trudeau. You're keeping Canada on the wrong side. Lily says, free Palestine, cease fire, save the children and people of Gaza, uh, and justice for Sarah Jama. Uh, and Kelly says, a public apology from the Ontario NDP is absolutely necessary. Um, Jess, Jessa says, we, we don't need to be on the inside of the party to have influence. Um, next up, uh, we're going to be hearing from Behan Farhadi, who is assistant prof at the University of Toronto and recently resigned president of the Scarborough Rouge Park Riding Association. Welcome, Behan. Thanks so much. I appreciate the organizing and the folks on the call and the folks listening. I'll keep it super short because there's really a lot um, that I want to hear as well and listen to. I don't think anyone knew I was the writing president until I resigned, quite frankly, because the reason why I joined my writing is because of the relationships I forged um, and the candidate that ran who um, has done so much work to build a community. So I wanted to sort of first acknowledge that there has been, um, for me in particular, and I think there are many um, who don't necessarily put their hope in electoral politics, but see it as a kind of useful tool. Um, this, uh, what happened with, with Sarah was in some ways a last straw. Uh, and I sort of wrote as much in my resignation letter uh, to folks uh, and saying that I had a, a great degree of moral clarity in the resignation um, and reference specifically the systematic dehumanization that was taking place. I do have some skin in the game with respect to my own identities um, and the impact of my family uh, and, and recognizing the impact this is gonna have on multiply marginalized folks, um, the interdependence that we have. Um, this is certainly not my first um, sort of, ex you know, encounter with uh, with resistance um, and, and reprimand with speaking Palestine. Uh, I think uh, it's always been the exception in our social justice movements. And um, it's to Judy's point, the stakes have never been higher uh, with respect to the material realities. Um, and so I what, what I also want to sort of say is that um, after my resignation, I, I thought about the power of resignations and the, and this and what it can do. Uh, and I think there's a lot that's not not visible. Uh, so, so I wanted to point that out as well is that there's a lot of folks, um, I wouldn't say necessarily working on the inside, but whose uh, who's principal positions maybe aren't getting as much um, circulation. Uh, and I think by virtue of the relationships that many of us have, we're, we're having sort of this uh, insight into the, the uh, afterlife of, of action. And I think in that way, I wanted to note that this is a really, it, it seems to have a much more um, wide scale impact than maybe is captured in media, both news and social. Um, and so I'm sort of working uh, listening and uh, aligning my action uh, to the folks who are leading this um, movement. And um, I sort of want to conclude by asking folks uh, who are listening to sort of think about what they have, uh, what spaces, systems, and people they have proximity to, uh, and to do, and, and sort of to work with integrity, because I think that's what Sarah has really demonstrated to me, um, and has consistently uh, acted with integrity, and, and why she's inspired so many um, folks who have turned uh, toward uh, the NDP in particular. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Behan, for those important words. Um, Really, really wonderful to have you here. Um, and thank you for your integrity and your courage um, and this critical analysis that you brought to us. Um, there are many that have been asking, will this be recorded? Yes, it will. And it will be available on YouTube um, to share. 
Um, also, just want to encourage people, I'll put the link in the chat to just subscribe to the, the YouTube channel. Um, lots of events and interviews there. Um, lots of comments in the chat again. Um, Maimuna says, um, hold on, a, sorry. Oh, no, I've lost them. I'll, I'll, I'll read them out a little bit later. Lost my place. Um, next up, we have um, Avri Jagdev, um, who is the Ontario New Democratic Youth Chairperson. So thrilled to have you here. Welcome, Avri. Hi, thank you so much. Thank you, Bianca, for the introduction and for organizing and for the co-organizers as well. Um, I'm very happy to be here and I'm going to keep my piece short as well, but I do a lot of work with the party and I thought it was really important for me to be here, not necessarily as an executive um, or, or an organizer, but just as a woman of color who is standing in explicit solidarity with Sarah. She's someone that I really look up to and I'm deeply disappointed uh, in my party for its decision to remove her from the caucus. And I am fairly new to politics, I'm quite young. I met Sarah in February this year at Mart South Leadership Announcement. And you know, I've met a lot of politicians, but I have to say she's incredibly genuine and down to earth. Um, she just felt like a friend and she has in the past weeks proven to also be deeply principled and steadfast in standing up for what's right. And it is not easy to stand up for what's right. It's even harder when you're in a room full of people who you know aren't going to agree with you. Um, and Sarah did so anyway, not once, but repeatedly over and over again, even after facing backlash and defamation and discrimination and threats to her safety, she stood firmly for what she believed in and she stood for the right thing uh, using the same terms that have already been used by the UN, by organizations like Amnesty International. And in doing so, she stood firmly in solidarity, not only with the people in Palestine, but also representing the thousands of people across this province and even more across this country who agree with her and are incredibly thankful for her. And I have to say, she is the bravest and the strongest voice um, in our provincial parliament. So it is incredibly shameful that she was removed from the Ontario NDP caucus against all odds, um, you know, and against systemic institutions, she made it into this position of power as a woman of color and as someone living with a disability. And she used that position to speak strongly, to speak for justice, only to be abandoned by her party and silenced by this government, uh, which is deeply undemocratic. And it's an example of how routinely the voices of racialized people and racialized women in particular are silenced in all sectors, including politics. And as one myself, I'm horrified and I'm deeply upset by her removal. To me, it's very telling of how diversity is something that is often uh, claimed to be strived for, but when marginalized people and when women of color and when Sarah showed up fully, it's deemed unacceptable. And in her case, even unsafe. And you know, Desmond touched on this, but the party's removal of her is made so much worse with their depictment of her as someone who's unsafe and uncontrollable. And it's horrible, it's unsettling to me, it's very eye-opening that in such a moment, the party decided to rely on anti-Black tropes against Sarah. I really can't imagine how she feels. And I sincerely hope that she is surrounded by so much love and care during this time. Um, and, you know, just to conclude, she deserves so much better. Above all, she should have been treated well by her party and she should have been supported uh, when she was being demeaned and harassed so publicly and when she was in a position that made her unsafe. Um, I seriously hope that she continues to represent her riding of Hamilton Center and use her voice because, again, it is the bravest and the strongest voice in our parliament. And I hope she goes on to do even more. She made the party so much better. And I know she'll continue to make spaces better. She's someone who I believe represents me. And I think we need more people like her in politics, not just more racialized women, but more people who are as principled and as courageous as she dares to be. Um, and I'm so very proud of her, her bravery and standing for what's right. It gives me the courage to as well. That's why I'm here um, standing in explicit solidarity with her as well as everyone in Palestine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Avrit, for those beautiful words um, and also for your courage in speaking out, um, even as you occupy uh, a position within the party. I know that is not easy. Um, in the chat, Rim says you're never too young to advocate um, politics. Omar says it's time to reflect deeply on the political structures that govern us. Verzada is calling for a free Palestine and thanks to all for being here. And uh, Youth Alliance says this was a dehumanizing response 
for Sarah, Black disabled women often experiencing uh, othering in this way. Um, so next up, um, very excited to uh, introduce Anjali Apadurai, who stunned us all in 2022 during her run for leadership of the BC uh, New Democratic Party. Welcome, Anjali. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much um, for, for being so responsive and timely, Bianca, in, in putting this together in such a, in such a critical moment. Um, and thanks for having me in. Right now, someone said this already, but right now it feels like um, it feels like a moment of cleavage. It feels like we are moving into something that we can never come back from. Like there is a there is a change. There's a change in the air. There's a moral fog around us that is stifling, and it feels very strange to watch our friends and governments openly endorse genocide, ethnic cleansing, and war crimes. And if you're in the ivory tower of politics, and if you live on the privileged side of the widening gap between our political elite and the working class, then it's harder for you to spot this seismic change in the body politic. And what Sarah Gemma did was simply exist as herself, as her principled self, outside of the willful ignorance and well-disguised fascist intent around us. She simply spoke in the only way her sharp moral clarity would let her which is to stand on the side of the oppressed, on the side of truth, and on the side of humanity. And there was no way to do that within the stifling confines of the narrow political process allowed by a party that was not on the right side of history. There was no way for her to speak her truth and follow their rules because the rules were not designed for them to do the right thing. I don't have the answers as to what the correct way to engage with power is. But what I do know is that White supremacy may learn to speak well, to co-opt the language of social justice. It can seem to bend over backwards to right the wrongs of the world and to stand up for justice. But as soon as there's a contradiction, as soon as there's an incoherence in that rosy story of the world, white supremacy will snap back to its comfort zone and reassert its own order of the world. What I do know is that organizing with our comrades filling the streets, taking action in all its forms, and more importantly than ever, speaking out and using our voice to speak truth in this time of such a lack of clarity, is more. it's more precious than ever. And I know that for myself, I, for so many of us, we will never forget how long it took for our progressive party to call for a ceasefire at minimum. And we will never forget how long the federal government uh, staunchly dug in its heels and with a stony face continued to reiterate support for Israel despite the death toll creeping higher and higher. I'm so sad that participating in the electoral system ends so badly for those who exist outside of the party norms and outside of the political elite culture. I have engaged with the system and I was actually embraced by it until I took a stance. And I do believe that we need to engage with the system to avoid, in all different ways, to avoid a future in which we exist at the margins and we have to fight a thousand times harder on the street just to get tiny incremental changes in the halls of power. I don't know what that future of engagement looks like uh, for any of us. I know that so many of us are sad and disillusioned and disappointed right now. And I, all I can say in this moment is solidarity with my sister, Sarah Jama. Um, she did the right thing. And the right thing right now was deeply, deeply uncomfortable to the status quo. And I'm so proud of all of us for recognizing that immediately and for showing up and for and for speaking in support of her. And um, I will I will continue to stand with those who have the courage to speak the truth when surrounded by that moral fog. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Anjali. Thank you for um, such strong, clear words. Um, thank you for speaking to the stifling moment that we're in, the bewilderment um, that I think we're all feeling, um, and for helping us to see through the fog um, and the spin, and for naming the seismic shift that, that is this moment. Also, thank you for getting up so early um, to rally with us. <laughs> um, uh, comments from the chat. Preach, preach, Anjali. Um, so I, I wanna take a moment just uh, right now to acknowledge just how complicit um, Canada is in Palestinian dispossession. 
And for those um, of you who are interested in going deeper, I'm going to post uh, a link to a webinar that, uh, that we hosted called The Innumerable Ways Canada Supports uh, Israeli Apartheid, because um, it starts at home. Um, next up, we're going to hear from um, Bizan Subi, who is a Palestinian Canadian who recently ran as an NDP candidate for Kitchener Centre. Welcome, Bizan. Hi, um, I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, I want to say thank you to Bianca and everyone who was involved in putting this event together. It's always, you know, the people who are carrying a really heavy load that pick up a heavier one. So I want to acknowledge that. Um, I, my name is Bisan Zubi. In 2021, I ran in the Kitchener Center NDP. I was the only Palestinian Canadian running in that federal election. Uh, it definitely exposed me to racialized violence that I had been able to protect myself from um, before that. And it opened my eyes to just what it means to be um, publicly advocating for Palestine, um, the things that people feel okay saying to you. The I, I received, you know, just vicious death threats and um, threats to my employment and all of that. And, and it, it very starkly showed me that the things that I was afraid of happening were realistic fears. And so whenever anybody advocates for Palestine and does it with their full throat, I recognize exactly how brave they're being in that moment, because this isn't just an NDP problem. This is an institutional problem. This is complicity across the board. There isn't a single political party in Canada that has moral clarity on what is happening right now. Um, and so that needs to be made very, very clear. We are looking at changing a system. We're looking at changing the way culture has, you know, um, uh, defamed Palestinians and, and defamed our struggle for freedom and equality and justice that has been going on for a really long time. So I think that needs to be made clear that this isn't just an NDP problem. This is just the latest kind of ugly head to emerge on this beast. And, and that needs to be made very, very clear. Um, I am also very conscious of how vulnerable um, women, racialized women, black women, disabled women are in these public spaces. And there is very little cognizance of that. And so oftentimes we are pulled into these public spaces, but there are no tools or, or any, there are no uh, plans to actually support us when we're there. It's just kind of like, oh, you wanted this. Well, now you got it, right? And the way that um, Sarah, who has always been such a wonderful voice of compassion, like this is one of the most compassionate, like selfless women I've ever like had the like pleasure of interacting with in, in political organizing, the way that she has been framed um, is it's not forgivable. And it's something that we do need to address and that we do need to actually um, call for uh, consequences for because it just shows any any future um, participant that this is what will happen to you, that this is the price that you you will pay for wanting to be involved, for wanting to, um, you know, uh, uh, stand on the record and and declare yourself um, a candidate or, um, you know, God forbid, even win and be <laughs> exposed to so much more um, abuse than even a candidate would receive. Um, I also want to note that this is something that I I have been watching Black women get vilified by their political parties for a really long time. This this isn't this isn't new, and this isn't something that most Palestinians love hearing from me. But I I Annamie Paul, who is was the leader of the Greens, was not pro Palestine, and 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 we have framed it as a victory that she was kicked out of the party. But how many Zionist voices are allowed to keep? their positions of power, um, despite having the exact same views. Her, her Blackness was very much in, to do with why she was able to be treated that way and humiliated and kicked out in that way. I, I don't take that as a win for Palestine. I took that as a win for anti-Black racism. And I, and I, and I, don't, I don't claim that. Um, this is a really hard time for Palestinians. Um, everything that we have been told about the Nakba, we are watching happening live in 4D 
it is traumatizing. Um, recent news out of Gazi is that all internet and telephone communications have now been cut. So after two, three weeks of no food, no electricity, no water, now they have literally no line to the outside world. Um, I don't think that there should be any doubt that what we're watching is ethnic cleansing and genocide in real time. And I think that we need to be very clear and very conscious about not, um, you know, equivocating from that. Like, we, we, I'm not an expert on genocide, but the experts on genocide say that this is what's happening. So we have to believe them and we have to heed their calls to act. Um, I I also don't know if the solution is her coming back to the party. We don't know. I don't know if that's what she wants. I think that we have seen that the party and the institutions need to change before they are safe spaces for us and before we can actually advocate and be safe in them. And so that is also work that needs to happen. Um, it, it has to happen across the board. People who are here and showing up for Sarah, that is the first step, but it, it, it goes so much deeper, right? And so thinking about how we hold our leaders accountable to those changes, how we are, um, you know, uh, demanding uh, the safety of, of speech even. Like I, I, I hate turning into a free speech warrior over this, but it's just like, I have never seen anybody be thrown out of a, a caucus and condemned for what I have understood is at least an incomplete statement. Like it's, it's, it's wild how far this has been allowed to go. And we need to be very clear that it's wrong and exactly what we see is happening. Um, I just wanted to end on a note of hope, hopefully. Uh, Twitter is, or X, whatever they're calling it today, um, is terrible. It is a, it, it is, it just, I, the, the images and the words have been violent and um and and really discouraging i think for a lot of us um but the other day i went on tiktok and tiktok is where young people are and i understand um that it might not be for everybody but i just need you to know the free palestine hashtag has over 2 billion views the i stand with israel hashtag has maybe 200 million it's not even close. Young people get it. They're seeing what's happening in live action and they are questioning everything. There is a lot of, there are a lot of questions that are being asked now that have never been asked before. This is both one of the darkest times I've ever felt being Palestinian, but it's also one of the times that I felt that I have been seen and our struggle has been seen clearly for what it is. And so I just want to leave you with that is that I do feel that things are changing. I do feel that the narrative is changing. I just think it's very important for us to stick true to this and stick true to this work and not give up and not be intimidated and not be silenced because right now people see that the things that our leaders are telling us and the reality of human beings on the ground are polar opposites, right? There is no there is no relating what we're hearing from our political quote unquote leadership and what we're seeing and the carnage and the destruction that we're seeing. Um, so I want you to recognize that we are not alone in this moment of feeling uh, betrayed by our um, political class. Um, a lot of people feel that way, but in this moment, the most powerful thing that we can do is just to keep advocating, to keep pushing the issue out there, to keep um, calling and pressuring whoever it is, elected officials, um, just to make it clear that we see what's happening, um, that we do not stand by it, and that we will be holding the people who are condoning or even encouraging or even funding this genocide, we will hold them accountable. And I, I you know, just uh, people kept talking about Oslo. No, like we're talking about The Hague. We're talking about The Hague right now with what we're seeing happening. So let's just be clear that nothing is okay right now and we need to keep fighting and we can't be cowed into silence. 
not in this moment, not, not right now. It's the stakes are too high. So I want to thank everybody for attending. And I want to thank all the other speakers for, for being there. And I want to thank Sarah so much for putting herself on the line as she has done throughout her entire political advocacy career. And as she is continuing to do in this moment, as she has been um, treated as a foil for all Palestinians and all, you know, all, all of those who support um, liberation and justice for Palestinians. So thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Bizon. Rousing, rousing words. Um, I just want to acknowledge um, of what a hard time this is for Palestinian people all around the world. Um, also want to acknowledge how brave it was um, for you to run and put yourself out there. Um, as you said, um, it is so wild to see how far all of this has been allowed to go. Um, but on the other hand, thank you for that TikTok tip. It's actually one of the most hopeful things um, that I have heard. For real. Um, so from the chat, Gemma says, solidarity with Sarah, free Palestine. Ruby says, we love you, Sarah. So proud of you. Charlene says, in solidarity um, with Bizan. Um, Miguel, solidarity with Gaza. Um, as you said, uh, we do need to keep acting. And so in that spirit, I want to point people to an important action um, initiated by uh, CFPI and Just Peace Advocates calling uh, for Sarah Jama to be reinstated. Since Monday night, over 4,000 people have emailed uh, NDP leader Mark Stiles, um, the ONDP president, Janelle Brady, and the caucus uh, to register their opposition um, through this action and the, their insistence that Sarah Jama be reinstated. They are getting these letters. Um, please do share them, join in this action. Um, uh, Karen from Just Peace Advocates is putting that action in the chat. Please share it, um, please take action. Uh, up next um, is Rima Burns McGowan, who is the former NDP Ontario MPP for Beaches, East York. Welcome, Rima. Thanks, but I know that Laura May has to leave, so I think she needs to speak next. Excellent. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Laura, love to have you next. Laura is the former MPP for Kitchener Centre um, and the former head of the, Black, of the NDP Black Caucus um, and former anti-racism critic. Welcome, Laura May. Um, thank you so much, and thank you, Rima. Um, of course, thank you to all of the speakers. I'm feeling so overwhelmed, so before I even direct any kind of comments and thoughts to Sarah, I just need to recognize that I am tuning in from my home in Kitchener, which is land that is held down, cared for, loved, and stewarded by the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the neutral people. Um, one of the ways that I've been uh, taught by elders in Indigenous communities that I have worked with, um, uh, with regards to the land acknowledgement, to turn it from, uh, in theory, we understand the land and the history of colonialism into something more active, is to sit uh, with this reflection, um, taking into account the fact that I'm having a particular conversation on stolen land. And the particularity of this, this conversation on stolen land for me um, leaves me thinking about two big things. The courage of uh, female leaders in particular uh, in Indigenous communities who hold that space of wisdom and history that take up a space that connect the dots when you think that it's an individual that just experienced harm, they remind you about that colonial history and about how the system is sort of reinventing itself to harm. Um, and also the power of people and community to make big change. The change that you don't think is possible is literally only made when people gather like we're doing right now for our sister Sarah Gemma. Um, and so with that as the backdrop, I also, like Desmond, just want to um, tell Sarah how much I love her. Um, tell Sarah that um, the party has this tendency, actually many parties do, but let's just focus on the ONDP for half a second. Um, the party has a tendency to reach out to advocates in community because it looks good and it feels good in the moment of recruitment. But then when we get into the system, they don't quite know what to do with us. Or in the words of Beyonce, they are simply not ready for this jelly. And when it comes to the time that I was elected um, and also when uh, Rima was there, the biggest difference was that we had a caucus. It wasn't like we were huge. 
but there were five of us that were black and elected in the ONDP, which meant there were five of us that had each other's backs when the going got rough, when we had things that we had to say, when there were issues at hand that had to be stated inside uh, the chamber, there was somebody else who had your back. When Sarah got in, the caucus had, or the party had already pushed out so many of the black elected officials that Jill was hold, Jill Andrew, MPP in Toronto St. Paul's, was holding um, as much of the space as she possibly could but it was a clear reminder of what happens when we advocate for change in political systems that are based simply on representation in a very superficial way, representation that is not sufficient to make actual change, but instead to make a party look good because you have one disabled person, three black people, or maybe just one, or sometimes two, um, you know, one person that represents all of this, the difference, so that they can't organize and hold each other with the love, care and support that these political systems are simply not um, able, willing to do. And so one of the, the things that we can and need to call on for Sarah, um, for her well-being, for her safety to demonstrate our love is that we keep coming together because the power of the people is what gives her the strength and the courage to be able to stand um, in the chamber, to be present inside the chamber and speak the voice of the people. It doesn't actually matter if she's part of a party or independent. What matters is presence, that, that Sarah is, is there. That's what makes me feel um, the most frustrated with the silencing. Because the silencing part, like, okay, fine, they kicked her out of the caucus. I have many, many feels about that. I'll get to them very quickly. But the silencing aspect is another part that we have to really take some time to think about. Because now her presence is particularly tokenistic. And that, my friends, is from all of the parties. Because everybody can count and everybody knows that no matter how many votes the ONDP puts on the table with the majority government, that that, that censor is going to pass. And so knowing that that was happening, um, the question is, where, where is her actual protection? And they didn't provide any. So she was unprotected inside the system and unprotected outside of that system. Just days before that vote, um, Sarah posted that she had to close her office because of um, hate, I'm putting the word hate into it, uh, that she received at her office. She did so to protect herself and her staff. I've been in a similar situation when I tabled Bill 67, the Racial Equity and the Education Systems Act. Um, where that was taken up by far right uh, folks who decided that they didn't want to do racist work in education. And I also had to make the choice to close my office for the safety of, um, of staff in that office. Even that is being spun as Sarah making other people unsafe. I just want to take a second to talk about the anti-Black trope that is thrown at Black women so often. We are making it uncomfortable for you. You are unsafe. And so the whole system has to come down upon you for speaking up. The reality is that Sarah made a decision likely on her own, if it was anything like this, the decision that I had to make uh, with Bill 67, to put her staff first and did not deserve to have the, the communication strategy of the party turn that around and say that she was making everybody else unsafe, hence why she had to be expelled from the caucus. It doesn't actually matter what was happening in the back end. I think it's actually uh, incumbent upon leadership to take a minute to think about the impact of the words that come out of their mouth and the words that they put on paper. It doesn't matter what was happening inside a caucus room. They had to have known that when they put that into the universe, that they were making it even more unsafe for Sarah and for her staff, for Palestinians across the province, for uh, Muslim community members, for Black people in general. They knew what they were doing. And that in and of itself is a problem. The other problem that I see and the thing that makes it so difficult and so courageous for Sarah to have, have um put her name forward and to be in this position and take on that role at, at Queen's Park is that there is no anti-racism critic in the official opposition 
um, for the province. I held that role when I was pushed out of the system. Um, I did not have that critic portfolio replaced. The other critic portfolio, colleges and universities, was replaced, but the critic portfolio for anti-racism and equity, to my knowledge, was not. The reason why this matters is because when we do have caucus meetings, your critic portfolio is your space of expertise to push back inside the party to help with communication strategies, to help people to understand what's actually going on. And in this particular situation, when it's very likely that MPP JAMA was sitting in caucus trying to explain what the people needed, there was nobody to hold that space of expertise and to have her back yet again. There was another uh, example of how much courage it took for her to do the, the work that she was and is continuing to doing. Um, the, the last thing that I want to say before I uh, hand the mic over is this. You cannot stand up as a leader in any capacity, say that you understand how anti-Black racism works, and then um, turn around and say that you were that there was a rationale for why you expelled Sarah Jama. You you literally cannot. You cannot say that you understand the inner workings of anti-black racism and then say but I felt unsafe or the staff felt unsafe or whatever because that is the trope of anti-blackness that you are using as your rationale for the action that you are now taking. And so if we understand how anti-Black racism works, then we would do the things that are that are needed to mentor a brand new member. Sarah has been at Queen's Park for about five minutes. In the five minutes that I was at Queen's Park, I needed support. But because there wasn't something that was so um, uh, loaded, politically charged, I don't know what words they're using for a war in which everybody should be a leader standing up for human rights, but whatever it is, I was given a bit more mentorship than the average bear. In this particular situation, I question the kind of mentorship that Sarah was receiving in order to be able to do the job well. And I want to be clear, that has nothing to do with how brilliant Sarah is as a community advocate. It has to do with understanding that there is a nuance inside that political system that has to be taught to you because you don't know it unless you are actually inside of it. And given that she wasn't provided with an opportunity to be part of the NDP while learning that, now as she sits as an independent, it is incumbent upon us, the people, to help her to navigate this system. She will not be able to do this alone, whether she decides to stay, accepts an apology, if there is an apology, it doesn't matter, but she will not be able to do any of her work without us consistently and continually reminding people that we have her back. And so Sarah, I've got your back. Sarah, I am so proud of the work that you've done well before you got to Queen's Park and all the way through. And my hope for you is that you make, you continue to make these choices. I don't even have to worry about that to stand up for human rights in all of its capacities and all of the nuances as you do. But I also hope that you choose joy. Make the choice that makes sense for you because we need you. Um, we need you in this life to build a better world, to build a stronger community, um, to do everything that currently the Ontario NDP seems to be too scared to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Laura May. Um, Wow, thank you for your critical work, um, for speaking to so many things, to the silencing, to the tokenism, to the nightmare of anti-Black tropes that Black women experience. You can see so many people in the chat speaking up about that, the lack of protection for Sarah. It's, it's Sarah um, that has been unsafe, um, and also Sarah, who's been courageous. Um, AI says, uh, we've got your back, Sarah. Salam in the chat says, Black women are being stereotyped as aggressive every time we speak up for marginalized folks. Um, Ariana says, Palestine will be free. Joseph, we're witnessing a genocide in real time. Um, so many comments. Um, thank you, thank you, Laura. Um, so I wanna remind folks at home um, to consider supporting uh, our work at foreignpolicy.ca um, slash donation. We're um, an organization that's on a shoestring budget and need all help we can get. 
to continue challenging um, unjust foreign policy measures. So Karen will put that link in the chat. We, we definitely want to be able to continue doing this kind of work. Um, up next, uh, we have Rima uh, Burns McGowan, who is the former NDP Ontario MPP for Beaches East York. Welcome, Rima. Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, Bianca, and thank you to all organizers uh, for putting this together. It's so important, and thank you for having me. I want to just uh, preface what I'm going to say by um, by saying that I am Jewish. I come from a mixed race background in South Africa. My parents left because of apartheid, and I was proud to be part of the Black Caucus that Laura May Lindo ran. I was uh, the MPP for four years from 2018 to 2022. And I decided ultimately, despite having been nominated not to run again, because of precisely the conditions that have created the fiasco that has brought us here today. Um, I, it's really important to understand that none of this is new and none of this is exceptional. As you've been hearing, all of the foundational and, and systemic issues that Laura May laid out have been there for a long time and that Judy laid out have been there for a long time uh, and that can, and continue to be there throughout. The, I want to say, too, I've been um, uh, raising the alarm and yelling about the importance of undoing the oppression of Palestinians and Palestine for 40 years now. I lost the contract teaching job uh, lectureship at the University of Toronto because of it. I've lost opportunities because of it. But still, because of my activism, the NDP still wanted me to run. The very first thing that I said when I walked in to talk to the person who had reached out to say, will you please run for us in 2018 is, you know, I support BDS, right? And I was told, yes, that's why we want you. So I was brought into the party and asked to run because I have a strong activist background. And then they spent the next four years telling me to shut up and sit down. Every time an issue came up that surrounded Palestine, such as the IHRA definition, we were told not to post about it. Of course, I posted about it anyway, and then I would get hauled into the office of the chief of staff and yelled at, or yelled at by phone call and told to stop. And I said, well, I've posted now, I don't need to post again, but then something else would happen and I would post again. I always framed it very carefully. I always framed it within a human rights perspective. I always use the voices of the very many Jewish advocates for uh, the end to oppression in order to frame these comments. So it made it harder for them to get at me, but fundamentally I was battling these same forces and after four years of it, I was done. And so none of what's happened now came as a surprise to me. I am extremely proud to have worked very hard to make sure that Sarah Jama did get the nomination and was able to be elected uh, in, in her writing. Um, I was very proud to have stood up and made a statement in the House demanding that the charges against her be dropped, the charges that were there for defending and helping unhoused people. And I have been I'm so proud of you, Sarah. I am so proud that you are indeed the person that I fought so hard to get into that house in the first place. I am devastated, but not surprised at what has happened to you. And I want all of you to understand that this is, again, it is not an exceptional thing. The party and the leader are saying that it has nothing to do with her stand on Palestine. We're calling for a ceasefire. We're aligned in that way. That what it really is about is she tossed surprises our way. That she kept saying, you know, not playing as a team. But the piece that you need to hear is the, the, the point that Desmond brought up in the first place. She insisted on using the word apartheid. She insisted on calling attention to the root causes of this horrific violence that is playing out now. Yes, it was started by Hamas, and Hamas is a brutal organization that deserves condemnation. But the root causes come from before that. You cannot oppress people for decades and decades and decades and decades and oppress and silence the peaceful, yes, uh, that, um, attempts at peaceful protests that worked in South Africa and then expect this to go away. It's not going to go away. 
And so you have to be able to use the keywords. You have to, in order to be able to an appropriate response. And if you won't use the word apartheid and you won't use the word occupation and you won't use the word oppression and you're demanding that she change those words in return for your solidarity, that's not, that's actually not going to get you to where you need to go. So I am, that is where the trust broke but they broke the trust. And so, yes, it's true that technically she wasn't let go because of her position on Israel-Palestine. She was let go because she didn't listen to Marit. But what she didn't listen to was the demand that she take down the word apartheid and good for her for insisting on that word. We cannot change anything unless we call it what it is. And you need to understand that it, there's an Israeli, human rights organization, B'Tselem, that uses the word, as well as Amnesty International, as well as Human Rights Watch, as well as many human rights organizations. So thank you, Sarah, for standing strong. We do need a progressive party in this country. We desperately need one. If it's not going to be the NDP, we need another one. But either way, the one thing that I do hope is that this crisis serves to fracture, remake the NDP in a truly progressive way, or that it leads, gives lead to a, an, another party that will actually be truly progressive, including and not except for Palestine. And please God, and however you refer to the divine, whatever you call the divine or spirit, Please, can we have an end to this violence? Because it's absolutely terrifying, not only the lives who have been lost to date, but the lives who will be lost if this continues. Thank you so very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rima, um, for those heartfelt words. That was, um, that was rousing. And, um, I just wanna to continue to uh, encourage people to take action um, wherever you can, uh, in, in your homes, in your communities, uh, sending letters. Um, now really is the time um, for action. Um, I'm gonna move swiftly to our next speaker um, because time is short. Uh, Khaled Muammar um, is gonna be speaking next. He is, the Pal he is a Palestinian Canadian and former national president of the Canadian Arab Federation. Uh, welcome, Khaled. I think you're still on mute, uh, Khaled. Yeah, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we, we would like first to thank uh, Sarah for standing up for human rights in Canada and overseas. And uh, as expected, uh, she became a victim because our institutions and the political parties are still really uh, controlled by racists. And this is why I also would like to appreciate and acknowledge the suffering and the preservation of the indigenous people who have uh, been suffering under these racist institutions for the last 400 years and continue to suffer as the Palestinian people are suffering in, in Palestine. Now, a party that claims to be progressive uh, should be protecting a member who is being threatened. Instead of that, the, the Ontario NDP shamelessly uh, kicks out a, a human rights advocate because they say their staff were threatened by racists and, uh, and supporters of apartheid instead of protecting her. And now she is alone and not being protected. And therefore we should be all standing and uh, uh, trying to help her because really she is a brave woman, a courageous woman, and she deserves all the support. Especially she, she feels the pain of the Palestinian people because here in Canada, the community is traumatized I've, uh, I've talked to women who are crying on the phone. I've, I know my daughter, when, when she goes to work, she feels always uh, threatened that somebody might attack her because she's Palestinian. Uh, 
uh, a student in Vaughan uh, who went with a kafia was suspended. Uh, even a teach, e e even a doctor at the Mackenzie Hospital in Richmond Hill was suspended because he put a tweet in support of the Palestinians and condemning genocide. And uh, recently, uh, a journalist with CTV in Halifax was kicked out. Also, was was fired. So, so this is a campaign to to silence anybody who stands for human rights, for international law, and this is what's missing in this whole thing. Uh, the political elite in this country and the mainstream media do not deal with the issue from the basis. The basis is apartheid is the cause is the root cause of all the violence in Palestine. The same way racism in Canada is the root cause of violence against Sarah and, uh, and threats against all these individuals who are suffering in Canada. This is, a, a, first of all, it's a regime of segregation. I have relatives in Palestine who are citizens of Israel. Uh, there are 2 million Palestinians who are citizens of Israel. A quarter of them are internally displaced, which are who are prevented from returning to the lands which are now controlled and confiscated by the state of Israel and reserved only for uh, uh, Jews. Non-Jews are not allowed on this land. So this is a racist apartheid system. If within Israel itself, on top of that, you have, you have the 5 million in the West Bank and the 2 million in Gaza who have no rights at all, no basic civil or human rights. And they are now, uh, Inside, inside, uh, inside of Israel itself, I received messages from Palestinian citizens saying that the police in, 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 in some towns and cities are threatening people who demonstrate against the attack on Gaza that they would be sent to Gaza. They are being threatened to be sent to Gaza to suffer. The other thing that's happening is that in the West Bank, more than 100 Palestinians have been killed simply for trying for protesting the attack on Gaza and settlers who are armed are, are able to go at any time and shoot anybody. And this is the suffering that the Palestinian people are encountering. On top of that comes Gaza, where you have the Minister of National Security, Itamar Ben Gvir saying the only thing that needs to enter Gaza are hundreds of tons of explosives from the Air Force. Not an ounce of humanitarian aid should be given. And we have our defense minister here, Bill Blair, saying, I don't want a ceasefire. He's, he's opposed to a ceasefire, and Israel has the right to defend itself. Israel has a right to kill children. Every 10 minutes, a Palestinian child is being killed. Every 20 minutes, a Palestinian woman is being killed. And here we have our political elite saying we stand with Israel because they have the right to defend themselves to do what? To break international law? Apartheid is a crime. It's a crime against humanity. To move settlers into the West Bank, this is a war crime. To, uh, to transfer the uh, occupied population, that's a war crime. That's what's happening in Gaza. One million people have been internally displaced. To, to bomb residential buildings as an occupying power. They have an obligation under international law to safeguard uh, the, the welfare and the safety of the, in, the population under occupation. And Israel is doing the opposite exactly. And not a single voice comes out from the- uh, Khaled, can I just ask you to yeah. move your camera up? We can only see the lower half of your face. We okay. want to see your whole face. Yes. Thank yeah. So, so what I'm saying is, yes, sorry. Basically, we have we have a problem in that we still have uh, we have a, we live in a country which still has not implemented uh, 82 of the recommendations of the uh, uh, Truth and Reconciliation Committee, which were passed in 2015. So, in eight years, they passed only. They have implemented only 12 of those recommendations. And this explains why a settler colonial country like Canada, still led by 
politicians and people in power who, who really are proud of their history in Canada will are, are standing with an upper side colonial system, which is killing the indigenous people and uh, violating international law with impunity because they are backed by people like Trudeau, by, by Marit Stiles, who, uh, who instead of standing with Sarah for, for, for talking about apartheid and talking about genocide and condemning ethnic cleansing, she is kicked out because she's keeping, she's causing unsafety for the other employees. What a hypocrisy. I mean, uh, Sarah is the one who needs the protection. And even if, if, if the other employees are threatened, that's, that's the role of the Ontario NDP to go to the police and find ways to, seek to provide the staff with security, but most of all, to provide security for Sarah not to kick her out, leave her alone, to face all these threats and intimidations. And that has encouraged, by the way, racists and white supremacists and apartheid supporters to attack now and suspend people. Uh, there, are, there, there are calls to, uh, to kick out, to fire 74 students, law students, because they issued a statement uh, condemning the genocide and ethnic cleansing being uh, being executed by Israel. There are people who are threatened in their jobs. They are afraid to talk. The Minister of Education, uh, Stephen Lecce, who's, uh, who's a racist, who has sent out statements to all the school boards conflating criticism of Israel with hatred of Jews, is encouraging, is encouraging school boards uh, teachers to clamp down on anybody who expresses anything in uh, any sympathy for the Palestinian people and who criticizes what Israel is doing. So students are afraid to say they're even Palestinians. They cannot wear kafiyas. They cannot uh, put a Palestinian flag on their profile. And this is, this is what, what is ending. And this is a minister of education who is uh, a Minister of Education of the Conservative Party, which was the one who started this campaign of vilification against Sarah. And instead of the Ontario NDP standing with this courageous uh, moral woman, they kick her out. That is an appalling thing. It, it, it resembles what, uh, what apartheid is, Israel is doing to the Palestinian citizens by threatening them to send them to Gaza and by closing conferences. There was a conference uh, planned in Haifa, an Arab Jewish conference of, about peace, and the police threatened the organizers with consequences and they had to cancel it. And this is exactly what the Ontario NDP has done. They are threatening people to speak out for justice, for equality against apartheid and for, for international law. But we are sure that uh, this uh, campaign will fail because as, as was uh, uh, mentioned earlier, the youth, the youth are standing you know, with justice all over the world. That's why you have demonstrations in every country in the world. How many demonstrations are there in support of apartheid Israel and its genocide and ethnic cleansing in Gaza? Not any. So the future is with justice, equality, and the dismantling of apartheid, which will happen, even if it takes another 50 years, as it happened in South Africa. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, um, Khaled. Thank you for your important words, your wisdom, and also for being such a long-standing advocate um, against Canada's complicity with um, the racist, um, Zionist regime and um, for your for your important words today and for so aptly describing the environment of fear um, that we are amidst and in which the vilification of Sarah Jama has um, has unfolded and thrived and um, in, just for naming the the threat that people feel for simply speaking out um, against apartheid against systems of apartheid 
Um, I, I want to, to acknowledge um, that there are there are there are people speaking out. We, we're seeing some some positive statements from places like Hamilton Writing Association have put out a strong solidarity statement, which some of you may have seen. Um, the Kitchener Writing Association have also put out um, a solidarity statement, um, which we're going to share in the chat. That uh, Quebec NDP youth have put out a very strong statement of solidarity um, with Sarah as well. Um, and um, really looking forward actually to, to, to hearing from Tom Baker, um, who's going to be speaking next um, and who sits on the Hamilton Center a writing uh, association executive. Also just want to take a moment to thank Karen Rodman, who is uh, in the chat right now um, and doing a great job um, there uh, of moderating all of these uh, comments and, and whatnot. Um, so Tom, um, welcome, welcome, welcome. Well, thank you, uh, Bianca and Karen, uh, for this invitation to be part of this important event and also for your heroic uh, moderation efforts. Uh, <laughs> I'm uh, speaking on behalf of the Hamilton Center NDP Writing Association Executive. I'm a delegate to the NDP Provincial Council. As you probably know, two days ago, we released a press statement in solidarity with our MPP, Sarah Jama. We strongly condemn the decision by our NDP leader, Marit Stiles, and her senior staff on October 23rd to expel Sarah from the NDP caucus. This shameful assault from the leader of our own party did not come as a total surprise to our executive. I want to provide some context of what's happened over the last few months. Since uh, Sarah's historical by-election victory last March in the by-election, MPP Sarah Jama has been subjected to endless criticism and intimidation by the leader for speaking out in defense of justice, truth, and human rights. I'm, there is a sad history in the NDP of caucus members, uh, candidates and prospective candidates and writing activists being silenced by the NDP leadership for their pro-Palestine remarks. Any criticism of the state of Israel has been falsely labeled as anti-Semitic by the party. This repressive atmosphere in the party has intensified over the past several months. In May and again in July, our writing association communicated directly with Marit Stiles and the party leadership, urging that she support her caucus members and other party members who were calling out Israel's abusive practices against the Palestinians. So that's a bit of background uh, that I think is important. Um, and now we have a situation where Doug Ford is in deep trouble with a series of land grab scandals and other issues. He was looking for a diversion. On October 17th, just days before the expulsion, six days before the expulsion, our writing association released an open letter to Marat urging that she dismiss calls from Ford's new housing minister, Paul Calandris, uh, for MPP Sarah Jamma to be censored for her so-called anti-Semitic misconduct. We stated in that letter that the the Conservatives demand to censor Sarah for vo voicing support for the recognition of Palestinian human rights was an inappropriate and racist overreach. We argued that such silencing of MPP JAMA would deny the voters of Hamilton Center in representation in government. We urged Mara to demonstrate progressive leadership on this matter and do everything in her power to support Sarah rather than cooperate with the corrupt PC party. And there was over 200 individuals and organizations that signed that open letter. Some of you were on the panel today here even. Marit's expulsion of Sarah from the caucus has served to enable the grossly anti-democratic censure by Doug Ford, which denies Sarah's voice in the legislature. The Tories are now able to shield themselves from the Green Belt and Urban Boundary scandal by, by their campaign against Sarah. Talk about snatching defeat out of the jaws of victory. That's what Marit and her st senior staff have done. MPP JAMA's statement that she boldly posted online, and, uh, and I'm proud of, to say it remains in place today, upholds human rights and international law. It certainly did not merit her removal from caucus. She called for an immediate ceasefire and de-escalation 
a position that's now supported by several uh, elected uh, uh, officials. Further, she urged us to look towards ending all occupation of Palestinian land and an end to apartheid. That statement still stands. And she told us right after it went up that this statement was never coming down. In removing JAMA from caucus, the ONDP leadership has demonstrated complete disrespect and contempt for the constituents of Hamilton Center riding. By disrupting MPP Sarah JAMA's constituency office operations, she has effectively denied the people of Hamilton Center ready access to critical support services. For an example, we have many residents that are on ODSP and the, all the complications associated with that. This betrayal by leader Marit Stiles and the senior staff at the ONDP has shattered the hopes of many activists, organizers, and community members who joined the NDP because of Sarah. Most of our membership are not old timers in the party. Sarah brought a whole wave of, of new blood to the party. And those activists um, mobilized to give her the resounding victory in that by-election. I can tell you there's widespread outrage in Hamilton and beyond. Riding associations and party activists across the province have offered their support to us in our efforts and uh, to get the MPP uh, Sarah Jama reinstated. So I'll just wrap up. We continue to stand with our MPP Sarah Jama unequivocally uh, as we have over the years. We demand that the ONDP rescind the removal of MPP Sarah Jama from the caucus immediately and that she be invited back on her own conditions. Uh, failing that, we demand that the member, a membership review of the leadership of Marit Stiles as provided for in the NDP constitution. We demand that the Ford government lift the undemocratic censure of Sarah Jama and restore full representation of the, uh, to the citizens of Hamilton Center in the Ontario legislature. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you for this strong statement of solidarity and also for such clear uh, action points as well for us in terms of going forward. Um, we are seeing a swell of support for Sarah. It is important to keep up this momentum. It is critical uh, that we do not let this stand. Our final speaker um, of the afternoon is Anthony Marco, president of the Hamilton and District Labor Council. Welcome, Anthony. Thank you, Bianca, and thank you for having me here today. I'm speaking on behalf of the 50,000 affiliated members of the Hamilton and District Labor Council. I'm a settler coming to you from the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabeg, Erie Neutral, Huron Wendat, and Mississaugas of the Credit, and we call for truth, reconciliation, and land back efforts for all, across all of our nations all the time at our Labor Council. And so we appreciate comrades who support our, our efforts in those things as well. And I also want to extend solidarity with anyone who's been triggered in the chat today by trolls. Thank you for enduring and upholding your solidarity through some of the vulgarities spouted by hateful people in the chat this afternoon. Um, you've certainly uh, you've certainly had to endure some stuff that I've been seeing come through the chat as well. And thanks to the moderators for being as quick as they could to get on, uh, get on those as well. Um, I'm here before you to voice our council's unequivocal support for MPP Sarah Jama and to condemn both her censure and her unjust removal from the Ontario New Democratic Party caucus. Sarah Jama's advocacy for Palestinian rights and her condemnation of the ongoing conflict is not merely an issue of international concern. It's a matter of free expression and a testament to the values that should underpin our political landscape. Her comments, initially deemed controversial by some, seem to have found some resonance across most political spectrums including almost every politician now who's coming up with something very similar to what Sarah chose to say, including the ONDP leader themselves, who put out a statement a couple of days ago, 10 days later, that looked almost identical to what Sarah put out and what caused her to get censured and kicked out by the party. Dissent, dialogue, and the exchange of ideas are the cornerstones of any free and democratic society. It is deeply concerning that Sarah's stance on a complex international issue led to her censure in the legislature and removal from party caucus. It sends a dangerous message that dissent and diversity of thought aren't welcome in the ONDP. In a statement that our council uh, passed last week, we called for an immediate ceasefire in the Middle East and reaffirmed our position for an end to the occupation of Palestinian territories. 
It's funny because politicians seem to think that this occupation of Palestine started with a single Hamas attack three weeks ago. I don't know how misguided they can be on this, but it seems like they think that this has all happened within three weeks and nothing happened before that. Palestinians have been oppressed in Gaza, the West Bank, and Jerusalem for 75 years. That Sarah made a statement exposing the continuing historical apartheid and colonial occupation instead of just the events of the previous couple of days were definitely her prerogative. They were factually accurate, and they have been proven to be demonstrably on point in the intervening time. We've seen that proven out over the past two weeks, over and over and over again. It seems like being prescient scores an MPP no points in the Ontario NDP or Ontario in general. Calling for peace results in a punitive action. We'd hope for better from the party. And on a side note, kudos to sitting MPPs like Dr. Andrew who openly challenged their party's decision. We hope that we see more of them in the coming days. If the Ontario NDP thought that they were going to solve PR problems through a historical reading of the conflict and the events of the past two weeks only, then perhaps it does not deserve to have a member like Sarah's and have a member of Sarah Jamis caliber in their ranks. For decades, the party has done everything they could to quash any discussion of the apartheid and occupation at every convention and council meeting. I've sat on provincial council before as a member of the Labour Council. I've been there many times, and I've gone to many of the conventions, federal and provincial. And whenever this topic comes up, you should see the scrambling of the people at the, up, at the tables at the front trying to find a way to not let these motions hit the floor. It is absolutely disgusting. And if we'd had something in place, maybe it would have helped to better inform everybody moving forward out of this. It's sad reality that at the federal convention a week and a half ago, they finally hurriedly, for the first time in I don't know how many years, actually put together a motion on Palestine, which was eh, tepid at best. It wasn't horrible, but it certainly wasn't great. And as a quick side note to Doug Ford, the green belt grifter and Sarah Jamma slanderer, stop your distraction games with your censure motion. Let's be very clear on this issue. Doug Ford and the Ontario PC party used deaths in the Middle East as a distraction from their green belt grift. That's the reality of it. They played off the deaths of people in this crisis right now to distract people from the green belt. They traded lives in Gaza for a week free from questions in, quest in question period about their greed. Here's the reality though. I've known Sarah for seven or eight years. Actually, we got introduced to each other through Matthew Green, who probably a lot of you know as well. In that time, I've seen her face down police at defund demonstrations. I've helped to keep the burn barrels blazing while she led a protest encampment in front of Hamilton City Hall. I've seen her rail against racism and oppression in all its forms. I've seen her create caremongering organizations to feed Hamiltonians during COVID and advocate for food security. And I've seen her activate racialized students across Hamilton into a new generation of activists across our city. When she decided she was running for office, the excitement in our city was palpable, and it drew up people who'd never even voted before, much less voted NDP. And I can tell you, I was down at Sarah's office yesterday, and the amount of people who are just coming out for support and to help from everywhere across the entire riding is absolutely incredible. If the currency of allyship and activism is showing up, she does that for Hamilton. And you can be damn sure that our Labor Council will do that for her because our Labor Council's cause is for working class people to rise up and every person that Sarah fights for past all of their other intersectional qualities are working class people, the same working class people that the Ontario NDP leadership claims to represent. So with that in mind, we urge the party to make a final effort to repair its relationship with Sarah, Palestinian Ontarians, and all those who stand in solidarity with them, including the working class people of the Hamilton District Labour Council, who also stand firmly behind our member of provincial parliament from Hamilton Centre. Just because Sarah cannot speak under parliamentary rules doesn't mean she won't be a bane to Doug Ford's existence every time she exits the chamber and a microphone is put in front of her. I assure you, in the riding of Hamilton Center, we will work to ensure she is reelected, whether she stands under a party banner or not. Because a call for ceasefire is not a call for censure, a call for decolonization is not a call for disassociation, and a call for peace is not a cause for punishment. We are with Sarah in solidarity, and we echo the same solidarity with all of you here today. Thanks very much. Yes, Anthony, thank you for this unequivocal support for Sarah Jama um, and to the cause for a, free, for a free Palestine. That is all the time that we have for today. I wanna thank our audience for filling this virtual room, um, for turning out in such great numbers. I wanna thank our incredible speakers, all of whom spoke on incredibly short notice 
Desmond, Julie, Behan, Avri, Laura May, Bizan, Anjali, Rima, Tom, Khaled, Anthony, thank you, thank you, thank you. Solidarity with Sarah Jama, Free Palestine, no to racism, no to apartheid, no to oppression. I want to thank Karen Rodman, um, who's been behind the scenes working, 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 and Just Peace Advocates, our co-host. Um, I do want to remind you to support us at foreignpolicy.ca slash donation. I want to remind people uh, to continue to take action, to pressure your elected officials, find out how you can be active in your communities, support people who speak out, stay informed, stay engaged. There are ways um, to act, and now is the time um, to do so. Solidarity with Sarah Jama and the siege of Gaza. No to Canada's complicity in Israel's crimes. Um, I'm going to say it again. Solidarity with Sarah Jama. No to racism. No to apartheid. Justice for the children of Gaza. Freedom for Palestine. Free Palestine. Good afternoon and, and peace, everyone.